Okay, class, we'll start chapter two in neuromuscular fundamentals. All right, so let's take a, oh yeah, remember these oil injections? So he started off like this, then he got a little bigger, and then he got ridiculous. And then this gentleman, same thing, started to do the same thing. And we talked about the end result for both of these. Again, uh, popular in Brazil, for whatever reason. These don't even look right. <laughs> I don't know. But anyways, uh, skeletal muscles are responsible for movement of the body and all of its joints. So muscle contraction produces the force that causes the joint to move. So interesting concept. You need the muscles in order for the joint to move. Muscles also provide protection. They provide dynamic stability of joints. They contribute to posture and support. They produce a major portion of total body heat. So these are good uh, questions. Muscles do all the following except, right? So when you see a slide with a lot of information, the best way to, for me to answer this is all the following except so that I know that you understand all these. Obviously, there's a ton of muscles. I don't expect you to memorize all 600, but in your anatomy class that you should have taken, you should know where most of these are. So if I refer to rectus abdominis, or if I say adductor longus, if I say adductor lateralis, you should know where to uh, uh, look. Um, if you don't, you might want to review this chart just to kind of make sure that, hey, once I mention something such as popliteus or biceps femoris, you have a general idea of where that is. And definitely, since you've had anatomy before, you are responsible for these muscles. So no origin insertion, but I may ask you uh, uh, actions, uh, location, etc., etc. Now again, there's over 600 skeletal muscles, comprise approximately 40% to 50% of your body weight. There's 215 pairs of skeletal muscles, usually work in cooperation with each other. Obviously, they perform opposite actions at the joints they cross. Aggregate muscle action, that means that muscles work in groups rather than independently to achieve a joint motion. So that goes back to, you know, when you go work out, you hardly do you want to just do simple bicep curls or just straight out hamstrings. It doesn't work like that. So if you just do exercises where you're just working your quads or just working your hamstrings, from a sports standpoint, that doesn't matter because remember, your quads, your hamstrings, your glutes, your popliteus, your anterior tib, your deceleration from your quads, deceleration from your calves, anterior tib, posterior tib, they all have to work together. So when you go to the gym and you train an athlete or you train someone that's sport specific, there's no way that you can just isolate one muscle and expect that outcome to be great. Everything has to work together. So that's why compound lifts such as deadlifts, squats, lunges work great. But the problem is if they don't have neuromuscular control and they have really bad form, then you're not going to get the results that you need. So this is where the neuromuscular control comes in. And again, this is going to be a great uh, chapter for you to understand that concept. Again, muscles are usually named based on their visual appearance, anatomical location, and their function. So the shape of the deltoid, the rhomboid, the size gluteus maximus, Terry's minor. So these are examples and of course we'll go over all these. How many divisions does it have? Triceps meaning three, biceps meaning two. Uh, and what's the direction of the fibers? Are they external abdominal obliques? Okay, so all these muscles are named for a reason, whether it's on their shape, whether it's on their size, whether it's the number of divisions or direction of fibers. The name of the muscle will tell you a lot of information. Location, rectus femoris, we know that that's the femur. Palmaris longus, that's near your palm. That's another way that muscles are named. What about the point of attachment? Coracobrachialis, that goes from the coracoid process to the brachialis. Extensor hallucis longus, that's, it's gonna extend the big toe. So again, what's the action? The Erector spinae, well, they work on the low back. Supinator, it supinates the arm, right? Action and shape, pronator quadratus. So it tells you the action and the shape of it. So don't just memorize muscles thinking, oh, these are weird names. They're named for a reason. They're either named for their location, they're named for their size, they're named for how they look, etc., etc. 
and then sometimes their name for their action and their shape. So adductor magnus, AD ducts. It's rather large and an AD ducts. Shape and location. Well, the serratus, that's the shape. It's serrated. I call that the Bruce Lee muscle. And it's on the anterior side. There's a serratus posterior as well. Location and attachment. Brachioradialis. Goes from your arm to your radius. And then the location and number of divisions. Located near the femur and biceps, it has two divisions. Those are your hamstrings. So that's the way you should memorize the muscles. What's the shape? The hamstrings. Number of divisions. Quadriceps, four. Triceps surae, three. Location, well, the abdominals, the shoulder girdle, the action, the hip flexors, right? Rotator cuff. So muscle grouping and naming. So learn them in groups, learn them in names. So that way, it's just not foreign words that you're trying to memorize. Muscles have different shapes and fiber arrangements. Shape and fiber arrangements affects muscles' ability to exert force. Range through which the muscle can effectively exert force onto the bones. Cross-section diameter, a factor in the muscle's ability to exert force. Keeping all other factors constant, a muscle with a greater cross-section diameter will obviously be able to exert a greater force. And the muscle's ability to shorten. Longer muscles can shorten through a greater range, more effective in moving joints through large ranges of motion. So the size, the cross-section diameter is all important. And then, of course, the major types of fiber arrangement, they're either parallel or pennate, and I'll show you examples of these. Each is further subdivided according to their shape. Parallel muscles, fibers arranged parallel to the length of the muscle, produce a greater range of movement than similar sized muscles with a pennate arrangement. So here are the parallel muscles, and those are either flat, fusiform, strap, radiate, sphincter, or circular. And I'll show you the examples of each. So again, we're in the parallel fiber arrangement category first. All right, so here's our man, Ritik Roshan, the Indian uh, actor. Here's another Indian actor, Shah Rukh Khan. These are your flat muscles, okay? So again, they're still parallel, but these are your flat muscles. Usually thin and broad, originating from broad fiber sheet like an aponeurosis, allows them to spread their forces over a broad area such as the rectus abdominis and the external obliques. Okay, so that's an example. So the rectus abdominis is an example of a flat muscle. We talked about the body fat, correct? Did I show you this? Okay, again, here's 3 to 4 percent, here's 6 to 7 percent. Here's 10 to 12 percent. So really to see your abs, guys, we need to be under 12 percent. And then for ladies, 10 to 12 percent, when you see your abs, uh, this is actually too too little. This is not healthy at all. Let me show you this cool little calculator, uh, uh, which will help you. Again, 15 to 17 percent, 20 to 22 percent. For most women, healthy is, I think, 25 30 percent uh, okay so this is a this is fine uh, I know some insurance companies will say this is uh, unhealthy but I think for most women 25 30 percent is actually very uh, healthy and that's fine for guys you know 15 20 percent is where most guys are but then we get into the dad bods of 30 35 and 40 percent the reason we don't like the bottom row is not because of appearance it's because it puts a lot of stress on the cardiovascular which is the heart right so this is your chance of mortality is increased because the stomach fat is not good for cardiovascular health that's the main reason so the more visceral abdominal fat that you have the worse it is for your heart in general. So for guys, if you're anywhere from, you know, 15 to 20 should be fine. For women, 25 to 35, you should be fine. The problem with 10 to 12% is your menstrual cycle and your hormone levels get uh, out of whack and out of sync. Okay, so in anatomy, you probably talked about the endocrine system. Fusiform muscles, yes, fusiform muscles, uh, those are spindle shaped with a central belly that tapers to tendons on each end. They can focus their power on small bony targets, and so examples would be brachialis and the biceps brachii. Okay, so again, we're still in the parallel form and the fusiform. Now, the strap muscles 
more uniform in diameter with essentially all fibers arranged in a long parallel manner, they can focus their power on small bony targets, such as the sartorius. Check out the sartorius right here. It goes from his number two all the way down. Those are the sartorius. That's pretty good, man, uh, that he can uh, develop that sartorius and be able to show that off. Okay. Now, again, we're still parallel. These are the radiate muscles. They're also described sometimes as being triangular, fan-shaped, or convergent. They have combined arrangement of the flat and the fussy form, originate on a broad aponeurosis and converge onto one tendon. And the examples are your traps and your pectoralis major. So make sure you know an example of each one. So from a quiz standpoint, I want to know the fiber arrangement and I want to know why it's called what it is an example. Okay. Now the sphincter or circular muscles, they're technically endless strap muscles, okay? Surround openings and function to close them. So orbicularis oris surrounding the mouth and orbiculus, okay? Surrounding the eye. Orbicularis oris, again, surrounding the mouth and orbicularis oculi surrounding the eye you've heard of facebook's new oculus right the, that's that vr uh thing that they have it's called oculus again orbicularis oculi is based on something that's eye pennate muscles they have shorter fibers arranged obliquely to their tendons in a manner similar to a feather arrangement increases the cross-sectional area of the muscle thereby increasing the power Categorized now, the, we're all in pennates now, so we, we're done with parallel, so we're in pennate now. Now, pennates are categorized based on the exact arrangement between fibers in the tendon. You have unipennate, bipennate, and multipennate. So, let's start with this as a very uh, flattering view, I know, but at least you'll never forget it. That's the pennate. Unipennate muscles, fibers run obliquely from a tendon on one side only. So an example would be the biceps femoris. Hey, he's got some huge hamstrings, crazy. The extensor digitorum and the tibialis posterior would be an example, but the main one is the biceps femoris. So another pennate muscle, this is bipennate now this was unipennate but this is bipennate fibers run obliquely on both sides from a central tendon so example would that would be the rectus femoris would be right here would be rectus femoris and here's a good quiz question the bipennate and the unipennate usually produce the strong, strongest contractions so your rectus femoris is strong and your hamstrings are definitely strong so they are they produce the strongest contractions Multipennate, they have several tendons with fibers running diagonally, so the deltoid is a great example of multipennate. Now, let's talk about muscle tissue properties. What do muscles do? Skeletal muscle tissues have four properties related to its ability to produce force and movement about joints. So they can be irritable and excitable. They can contract, extensibility, and elasticity. So knowing the definitions of irritability, contractility, extensibility, and elasticity will be very important. So let's start with irritability or excitability. The muscle property of being sensitive or responsive to chemical, electrical, and mechanical stimuli. Can that muscle contract? Is it irritable? Is it excitable? What is that? Okay, that's very important. Now contractility is ability of muscle to contract and develop tension or internal force against resistance when stimulated. Can it do that? Okay, so it's gotta be irritable or excitable. It can be able to have contractility. Another thing is extensibility, ability of the muscle to be passively stretched beyond its normal resting length. Is it stretchable, extensibility? Elasticity is the ability of muscles to return to its original length following stretching. Okay, so from an injury standpoint, we want good extensibility and we want good elasticity in all of our muscles, right? It has to have the ability to be passively stretched beyond its normal resting length, and we have to have muscles be elastic, meaning the ability of the muscle to return to its original length 
following stretching. So muscle terminology, intrinsic, pertaining to usually to muscles within or belong solely to the body part on which they act. So small intrinsic muscles found entirely within the hand or the feet. That's what it means, intrinsics, intrinsics of your hand and your foot. Extrinsic, pertaining usually to muscles that arise or originate outside of or proximal to the body part in which they act. So example, the forearm muscles that attach proximally on the distal humerus and insert on the fingers. So this is an example of an extrinsic. Intrinsic would be just within the hand, but you see how this goes across multiple joints. That would be an extrinsic. Action, specific movement of a joint resulting from a concentric contraction of muscle that crosses the joint. Example would be the biceps brachia, which has the action of flexion at the elbow. Actions are usually caused by a group of muscles working together. Remember, brachia means arm, biceps meaning two, so two heads of muscles around the arm. Any of the muscles in the group can be said to cause an action, even though it is usually an effort of the entire group. A muscle may cause more than one action, either at the same joint or of different joint, depending upon the characteristics of the joints crossed by the muscle. So understanding that a muscle can cause more than one action, depending on if it's a one joint or a two joint muscle. And we'll discuss that with the hamstrings and even the biceps. And let's say how to do different exercises based on one or two joints is very important. So innervation, muscles always have innervation segment of the nervous system responsible for providing a stimulus to the muscles fibers within a specific portion. So you have the sciatic nerve, you've heard of that. Now if you have injury to the peripheral nerve, they can grow back, but if you have an injury to the spinal cord itself, that will not grow back. So a muscle may be innervated by more than one nerve, and a particular nerve may innervate more than one muscle or a portion of a muscle. So some more <laughs> muscle terminology. Let's look at amplitude. Range of muscle fiber length between the maximal and minimal lengthening. Gaster, or the belly, central fleshy portion of the muscle that generally increases in diameter as the muscle contracts. The contractile portion of the muscle. So let's talk about the belly. So let's just talk about biceps in general. How would you get a nice looking biceps to kind of be more rounded versus the elongated look? So what exercises would you do? Remember, biceps are a two-joint muscle. So understanding the, uh, the origin insertion, understanding the belly, understanding the amplitude will help you design what your goal is. So if I want a nice rounded look of the biceps versus a nice elongated look, tell me what exercises you could do. Okay. The tendon, that's a fibrous connective tissue often cord-like in appearance that connects muscles to bones and other structures. Two muscles may share a common tendon, example the Achilles tendon of the gastroc and soleus. Uh, a muscle may have multiple tendons connecting it to one or more muscles. So remember uh, Kevin Durant was out for the season, Boogie Cousins, I mean you, I can name a plethora of injuries uh, where they ruptured their Achilles tendon and of course Kobe Bryant uh, tore his Achilles as well. Aponeurosis, a tendinous expansion of dense fibrous connective tissue that is sheet or ribbon-like in appearance and resembles a flattened tendon. Aponeurosis serve as a fascia to bind muscles together or as a means of connecting muscle to bone. So you have your palmar aponeurosis, palmar aponeurosis for the palmaris longus. Now let's take a look at your palmaris longus. Some of you have this and some of you don't. And then fascia. This is very important. I love this uh, fascial lines. We have to understand why you're stretching and how you're stretching. Usually you don't stretch correctly because of fascial lines. So fascia is a sheet or band of fibrous connective tissue that envelops, separates, or binds together parts of the body such as muscles, organs, and other soft tissue structures of the body. 
in certain places throughout the body, such as around joints like the wrist and ankle, fascia tissue forms a retinaculum to retain tendons close to the body. So instead of just statically stretching one way, if you stretch along the fascial lines, I think you'll get a better result. So let's let's look at some of the world's greatest stretches. And I think if you start stretching this way, you'll get better results versus just stretching your hamstrings because of these fascial lines. So let's let's look at this. So here's the world's greatest stretch. Okay, so now you're stretching along a fascial line. So I'll show you uh, a video of this shortly, but here's an example of the world's greatest stretch. Uh, start incorporating this. So this is again incorporating fascial lines and then understanding these. Okay, so you're stretching hip flexors, you're stretching thoracic, you're stretching the pecs, you're stretching all these together because remember in sports all this has to be pliable excitable elastic in order for you to prevent injuries versus you just doing one simple hamstring strength or a rectus stretch it doesn't work like that everything works together so let's look at some videos of some really good stretches here 